slight delay with We are live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call uh, to this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to our virtual Board of Regents meeting. We usually hold the October meeting at our Flint campus, and I look forward to returning to Flint for an in-person Regents meeting when we can safely do so. We're all remote today, so I'll call roll of all the Regents one by one so they can be noted for the record and for those not able to be seen on the screen. Regent Acker. President, good afternoon, President Sosa. Thank you. Regent Beam. Here. Regent Bernstein. Regent Brown. Here. Regent Diggs. Present. Regent Illich. Present. Regent Weiser. You're muted, Ron, but I can see you. Here. <laughs> and then Regent White. Here. Thank you. And uh, I know that Regent Bernstein is trying to connect. He's dealing with a, a technical issue that's probably on our end. Uh, we're also joined today. Uh, oh, there's the Regent Bernstein. Hi, Mark. Uh, we're also joined today by all the university's executive officers. Uh, on Tuesday, the Washtenaw County Health Department in collaboration with U of M issued a 14 day stay in place order for our undergraduate students. The order is an important preventive intervention to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and enhance protections for our students and the welfare of our community. I know there are questions about why the order was limited to undergraduates and why certain activities are still permitted. As the county notes, the action puts restrictions in place where spread is occurring based on data and on case investigation. Tuesday's order is in addition to the mitigation actions already taken to address a cluster of students with COVID-19 in the Mary Markley Residence Hall. Beyond the stay in place order, the university implemented additional changes out of an abundance of caution and to provide freer choices for students and instructors. This includes moving more of our undergraduate courses to fully remote instruction. It's important to note that most of our campus remains unchanged during the stay in place order. Research and patient care continue. Graduate students continue in their studies. In-person classes continue where the format is essential and many facilities remain open. We already have most people working from home and most courses already were being taught remotely. The good news is that the risk of classroom transmission remains low. The health department confirms that the increasing COVID-19 transmission we're seeing is not coming from activity in our classrooms or labs. Also, they're not observing spread from our students to unrelated members of the Ann Arbor community. Our new guidance for course formats makes it as simple as possible for undergraduate students to comply with the order, provides choices for students and instructors, and supports those students who may choose to leave Ann Arbor and finish their semester from home. The health department order requires students living in Michigan housing to be tested for the virus before returning home for the remainder of the semester. Likewise, we advise all undergraduate students living off campus to be tested before they leave Ann Arbor to reduce the likelihood of spread. U of M is providing tests free of charge for all students under our community sampling and tracking program and we've shared information on departure testing and protocols with students, including how to schedule their test. On behalf of the university, I thank County Health Officer Jimena Lovelock and her colleagues for their partnership. We've been coordinating since before the early days of the crisis, and this partnership has allowed us to respond to the challenges of the pandemic. Additionally, I thank everyone who's been diligent in following public health guidelines and the many thousands of students and employees who've supported community health and safety. This commitment to everyone's safety will be an enormous help to our community for the rest of the semester and beyond. 
U of M is very pleased to be partnering with the city of Ann Arbor to provide a satellite office location for the city clerk at our Museum of Art on State Street. All students, faculty, and staff can use the location to register to vote and cast early in-person absentee ballots right up until election day. I dropped off my ballot earlier this month. Any Ann Arbor resident voting absentee may also return their ballot at a drop box provided by the city near the North Campus at the fire station on Beale Avenue, just off Plymouth Road. I thank our partners in city government, as well as the Stamp School of Art and Design, Associate Professors Stephanie Rowden and Hannah Smotrick for their work to make the UMA satellite office possible. The office is part of a multi-year research effort by Rowden and Smotrick, inspired by historically low student voter turnout in 2016. Additionally, our democracy and debate theme semester is underway with engagement and learning opportunities that stretch across our campus. The Washtenaw County Health Department's stay in place order specifically exempted election related activities at polling places, including going out to register to vote, and to vote on or prior to election day. Additionally, the order exempts working or volunteering, which could include working at a polling place to the extent the work cannot be done remotely and you have the approval of your employer. The privilege and responsibility to vote is a hallmark of our engagement as citizens of a democracy. I strongly encourage everyone to register and participate in this process by voting on or before election day. I congratulate University of Michigan mathematics alumnus, Paul Milgram, who was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Milgram and fellow researcher, Robert Wilson, were awarded the prize for their research about auction theory, a branch of economics that researches how people act in auction markets, as well as the properties of auction markets. The pair used auction theory to design new auction formats for buying and selling intangible goods, such as radio frequencies. I invite everyone in the U of M community to attend our Diversity Summit Community Assembly presented virtually on Monday from 10 until 11.30 in the morning. The summit will feature experiences that highlight the progress of our strategic plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion as we continue to engage our community around these crucial and cherished principles. This year's theme is arts plus social change, building an anti-racist world through the arts. It will include a array of outstanding speakers with TED style talks and a panel moderated by Professor Aaron Dworkin. Our arts initiative is also a partner in this year's summit. The arts are a powerful vehicle for social change and I applaud our many faculty, students, and staff over many generations whose commitment to justice and peace extends from the music of our Burton Tower Carillon to the many performances, exhibits, scholarly works, and artistic creations that foster cultural understanding, give voice to marginalized individuals and communities, and emphasize the pressing need for change in our society. Provost Collins will have an additional update on our work to combat racism later in the meeting. The Wolverine football team will take the field for its first game of the season this Saturday in Minneapolis. They're doing this safely under medical supervision and with strict adherence to safety protocols and daily rapid COVID-19 testing provided by the Big Ten. As we cheer on our student athletes, I wanna emphasize the importance of enjoying all of our games home and away in the safest manner possible. It's essential that we all follow public health guidelines when we watch, practice social distancing, be safe indoors and out, and follow the stay in place order if you're an undergraduate. The game will be available on ABC, which students in the residence halls can stream for free using Philo internet television. Uh, information can be found at the television and video link at its.umich.edu backslash services. Wear your face coverings when away from your room or home and wash your hands, please. 
by caring for ourselves and one another, we can all enjoy the season and be safe. I'd like to ask Chancellor Dutta to introduce today's presentation from the Flint campus. Thank you, President Sushil. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our new provost, Dr. Sonja Fees-Price, who began her new role on August 1. Dr. Fees-Price came to us from the University of Kentucky, where she held several senior administrative positions, most recently the Vice President for Institutional Diversity and was a full tenured professor in the College of Education. Her association with the University of Kentucky goes even longer since she earned her PhD there after earning a doctorate in rehabilitation from the Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Dr. Fees Price was a visiting professor at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a licensed psychologist, a licensed a clinical counselor in the state of Kentucky, and a national certified rehabilitation counselor and a trained mediator. Provost Fees Price has embraced our academic enterprise with passion and vigor. Mindful of the Liberal Arts Foundation of Yogan Flint, she is taking a data-driven, metrics-focused, collaborative approach to solidifying academic excellence and enhancing student success. We are very pleased to have her as our provost, and now I will invite her to speak. Sonja. Thank you, Chancellor, Chancellor Dada. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to be a member of the UM Flint leadership team, where I have the privilege of working with Chancellor Dada and his leadership team. We are a team of collaborators who engage our colleagues on strategic innovative initiatives across the enterprise to bring about meaningful change. As the chief academic officer, I am proud to work with our deans who are committed to positioning the university for sustained academic excellence and student success. Our campus is currently in the process of implementing the Project 2020 Action Plan that focuses on recruitment, retention, and graduation rates by promoting our in-demand academic programs and creating new ones. I extend my gratitude to President Schlissel and the Board of Regents for their extraordinary support of UM Flint and the recent approval of the College of Innovation and Technology, which is being made possible in part by a grant from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. This is a wonderful time to be at the University of Michigan Flint as we embark on a great renaissance. And this is exactly where I want to be. And I don't wanna just work in Flint. I want to understand Flint, which will allow me to enhance campus community partnerships that will exist for many years to come. Recently, I spent hours immersed in the neighborhood surrounding the downtown area. And I did this because I wanted to hear from and engage with residents of Flint to learn about their community based on their lived experiences. And in so many ways, Flint is very similar to the place where I grew up in Southwest Louisiana. And I often hear the people of Flint described as resilient and they are certainly that, but they're also wise wise because of how circumstances and experiences have shaped their lives. They are the teachers of this community. As a first generation college student, I share this experience with many of the students here at UM Flint. I know what it means to carry the expectations and the hopes of a family through a college education. And that is why this role at the University of Michigan Flint is my passion and my calling to be the mentor and advocate for this generation and future generations of pioneering college students. Since I've been in Flint, I've been thinking quite a bit about my favorite quote by Horace Mann. Education then, beyond all other devices of human origin, is the great equalizer of the conditions of men and women, the balance wheel of the social machinery. This quote reflects my philosophy. 
Education is the mechanism, the pathway, the beacon of light that we must share with every member of our society. That is our job. To be an equalizer, we must maximize our research mission. That is where knowledge translates to practical applications that solve many of our society's most complex problems, uplift communities, and positively impacts current and future generation. That is the power of education. And that is what Horace Mann meant when he talked about education being the balance wheel of the social machinery. Education is the mechanism that serves to build, to strengthen and sustain our society. And if we are to be the balance wheel of the social machinery, the balance must take into account that each of our students come with unique lived experiences that are already a part of their education. At UM Flint, they receive high quality education with applied research opportunities within a societal context. And at the end of their time with us, they should be able to find a good paying job and ultimately a career allowing them to care for themselves and their families while contributing in positive ways to their community. Our students and our community need us to keep this renaissance going so that we can meet them where they're at and get them to where they want to go, all while positioning, to, while positioning the University of Michigan Flint to truly be the best in class among regional public universities in the very spirit and tradition of all that the Block M represents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Provost, and welcome to the University of Michigan. I see you're getting a Zoom round of applause. So thank you very much, wonderful comments. Thank you. Uh, I next turn things over to Executive Vice President uh, Kevin Hargerty to introduce our next speaker. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I am pleased to introduce the university's chief investment officer, Mr. Eric Lundberg. Eric has served the university as CIO for 21 years, having just celebrated an anniversary earlier this week. His track record amongst his peers and on behalf of the University of Michigan has been absolutely outstanding. Eric will present highlights of the investment portfolio and results for the fiscal year 2020, which ended on June 30, and provide information and perspective on the endowment and the endowment payout. Welcome, Eric. Eric, you're still on mute. All right, better? Better. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me all to, uh, today to talk to you. Um, we sent out some slides in advance, and I will just touch on, on some of them. Um, the, uh, the highlights on some of these slides, I'm not going to go through each one, but uh, um, the slide that you see in front of you now, you show this, it shows that the financial reserves of the university is now at $16 billion, which is quite, quite a big increase from, from last year. But if the most of the um, increase is COVID related. Uh, if you see in the bar on other, it, um, it reflects a, the proceeds of a bond issuance that the university undertook uh, earlier this year um, to deal with the fallout of the COVID crisis and uh, how that impacted the university. And likewise, the working capital funds grew a little bit, but that also reflects um, several one-time payments uh, that were for COVID uh, related relief. And some of those um, maybe have to be paid back over time. Uh, if, you look, if you look at it, just the, the, basically this slide shows the largest pools of the um, $16.1 billion. And the largest of which is the endowment funds of $12.5 billion, which seems like a very large endowment. It didn't change much from last year. It, it rounds up to 12.5 billion last, this year. It rounded down to 12.4 billion last, uh, last year. Uh, the difference is less than $50 million. So not, not a, it was an interesting year in terms of um, investments, but point to point, not that much happened. And the key about the endowment, uh, just to spend a little time about what the endowment really represents, 
we call it the endowment funds. It's really a collection over 12, more than 12,000 individual endowments um, that each of them have an owner. And most of them, many of them have a specific purpose. Um, they are spent to be spent in a certain way. And the way we manage this endowment, and uh, the great thing about having a large endowment is that it's all going to be spent over time. And the way we manage it is that we have a distribution rule. And the distribution rule, what it's trying to do is to preserve the purchasing power of all, each of the individual endowments over time. Um, the endowment grows by investment returns and by new gifts. And what we want to focus on, and we try to focus on, on each of the individual endowments that don't get new gifts. New gifts go to new, in, uh, new initiatives. Uh, so a scholarship that was established uh, this year or 10 years ago, we have a distribution rule that tries to ensure that the distributions from that scholarship uh, fund um, remain stable and slowly increasing over time. So they keep up with inflation. So that the four and a half percent that we pay out today, that we paid out 10 years ago, it buys the same uh, amount of support today and it will do so 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We don't try to grow the endowment uh, in size. We just try to keep up with inflation. And that's really what we're trying to do. And you're gonna see later over time, the returns of the endowment over 20 years have been a little over 7%. Um, that is sufficient to support the spending of 4.5% plus 3% inflation. And it hasn't really grown in real terms over that period of time. If you go to the next slide, um, you can just see the growth, which is quite, it looks quite substantial on a, on a chart like this over time. Uh, and it looks like a very large amount of money. Uh, but as I said, it's really just keeping up with inflation over time. And um, we may seem large in terms of uh, dollar amounts. Uh, we have a large, you know, we rank pretty high compared to our peers. But when we look at our, the number, we, so we have a large endowment, but we also have a large university. So on a per student basis, with the 90 rank number 99th, and we've been around that ranking around 100 over the last several years, a little bit over, a little bit under, but pretty much the same over time. So while we have a large endowment, it's pretty much, you know, it's spoken for in a large way, and it supports a very large university. So we, I can touch a little bit on the performance uh, for last year. There's a slide there that shows the performance uh, on page seven, I think, um, which page six, correct. Um, it was a very unusual year last year. And this, this slide really reflects the unusual nature of last year. Point to point, the return was 2.2%. Um, pretty much in line with the benchmark. But what, what you see on this, this chart here really shows that what happened in the, uh, in the overall economy, things that were attached to the real economy uh, went down in a very large way. So it's these things like natural resources, which are heavily tied to economic activity, um, showed losses. And that was reflecting, you know, the demand shock to the economy that followed the global shutdown after COVID that still remains in place and, and has been slowing uh, economic growth for some time. Real estate, that reflects some sectors that did relatively poorly and some that did okay. Uh, if you look at retail and leisure, those are severely hit by the, the crisis. People stopped traveling, they stopped shopping. In many ways, they couldn't go shopping for a long period of time. And that's reflected in those numbers. Now, things that are not tied to the real economy, that are tied to the new economy, or what's perceived to be the new economy, did exceedingly well. Uh, our venture capital allocation captured a lot of that. And um, that was up 19%. You put it all together and you go all the way to the right and you look at the overall stock market and we have a global benchmark for stocks uh, and a global portfolio. Uh, 
um, it was relatively flat because it's a combination of new things and old things. And uh, the returns were largely washed for the year, just for stocks. Um, now, some stocks in the US have done really well. So it's worth spending a little bit of time on that in that if you listen to the news, it looks like stock markets just go up and up. Um, stock markets don't go just go up and up. Large portions of the stocks, a very large number of stocks showed losses for the year. A handful of very large stocks like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, the new economy stocks went up tremendously uh, last year. But outside of that, stocks did not have a particularly good year. And it's particularly not globally because um, the, of the uh, economic impact uh, or the impact on the economies of the um, COVID um, restrictions. Now bonds, fixed income, which are bonds, worth spending a little bit of time on, great returns this year. All that means is that future returns from fixed income is going to be much lower because now interest rates are under 1%. And that is pretty much what we expect to get over the next 10 years from fixed income, between 1% and 2%. It's very difficult to get more than that out of bonds. If you go to the next slide on page 7, this looks over the 20 years. And this is more illustrative of what we think is going to happen going forwards. We think stocks are generally expensive, particularly in the U.S., reflecting these rapid increases in some very few stocks. There are also some very cheap stocks that are still impacted by the economic slowdown that will recover when the economy comes back. We think fixed income, I just touched on that. The returns gone for the last several years have been ter terrific, the last 20 years, but we've had been in an environment of falling interest rates and now they hit almost rock bottom. So fixed income is not gonna look anything like that going forward. We've had a good run in fixed income. Cash is probably where it's gonna be. After return is a collection of uh, various strategies that are designed to be relatively independent of the overall economy. We think that's a reasonable number to, to to uh, look for in future returns like we've had in the past. Venture capital, it's a little timing issue. It drops off a tremendously good year of venture capital. Uh, we expect venture capital to do better than equities, similarly with private equity, real estate, similar to equities uh, overall, and natural resources, that bar is gonna come down somewhat, but it's still gonna be a good area to invest in. So if you look at the long-term return of 7.5%, there's a pretty good return. In fact, that's top decile. So uh, of all the college and university endowments, uh, the average endowment is something like um, five and a half percent over that period of time. So it goes back to the spending rule. Why do we have the spending rule that we have? We spend four and a half percent over seven years. Average the seven-year averaging smooths out the volatility of the markets. Uh, we've had up years, and it's easy to forget we're also going to have down years after you know the run we've had in the last 10 years. Uh, last year was a reminder that all years are not great years. We were lucky to have a 2% return. The average return of an endowment was 1%. Several endowments had lo showed losses. And you know, you go back, had the year ended a month earlier, we might have shown losses too. Uh, and that's what's going to happen in financial markets. So it's important to smooth out those uh, dips and also to smooth out the tops and average those out over a seven-year average. Um, and then we set the rate of distribution at 4.5%, which we think is 4.5% plus inflation of 3% is 7.5%. And if we think that's what's going to happen going forward, and I think that's a reasonable return, for a long-term endowment. In the past 20 years, it's been way up in the top quartile. As I mentioned, it's been top decile. Um, and the average endowment has been five and a half. Uh, it may seem easy to make, you know, 20, 30% uh, investing in stocks only, but what we're trying to do is to have a diversified portfolio that taps into many resources of income and growth globally, so that when some areas are doing poorly, 
Um, other areas will do well. This last uh, period, uh, several years, the U.S. has done better than the rest of the world. We think that you know, going forward, the rest of the world could very well do better than the U.S. And that's really the end of my prepared remarks. So thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Any questions uh, for Eric from the board? Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to a report uh, from one of our committees, the Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee from Regent Bernstein, the chair of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mark. On Tuesday, October 20th, the Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee members, along with, uh, and that would include uh, Regent Diggs and Regent Weiser, uh, along with Kevin Hegarty, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer Brian Smith, Associate Vice President for Finance Cheryl Soper, University Controller and Director of Financial Operations, Eric Lundberg, Chief Investment Officer, and Jeff Molek, Executive Director of University Audits and Representatives from PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, who did a fantastic job on our during our audit process this year, as always, uh, discuss the university's fiscal 2020 financial results and the results of the related external audit. I'd also like uh, to say that, uh, in, that this past fr February, which seems like uh, a century ago, uh, the board announced that we are interested in considering the investment policy of the university with regard to fossil fuels. We have discussed this at virtually every meeting, as my colleagues know, uh, since, and we continue to do so. Uh, in the next few weeks, we intend to meet with subject matter experts in this area to help inform and advance our deliberations. We plan to have a more detailed announcement regarding our investment policy in the coming months. We know how urgent and important this is for our university and our planet, and this issue remains a high priority of ours and the administration's. Uh, thank you, Regent Bernstein. Uh, board Chair Regent Illich uh, had a uh, brief update to provide before we move into the regular business agenda. Uh, Denise? Thank you, President Schlesel. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I want to update information shared at the most recent uh, board meeting on the commitment to address recommendations from the Wilmer Hale report on the sexual misconduct of Martin Filbert. The president announced that the Board of Regents would hire an outside firm to provide an external perspective and to help the president and board oversee the work recommended in this report. Since that time, we have identified multiple qualified firms and we are now in the process of interviewing them with the goal of selecting a firm in the coming weeks. We will have more to report at the next board meeting on this process. This remains one of our top priorities and we are moving quickly but carefully. The goal is to ensure the highest possible standards for the university. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Regent Illich. Uh, we now move on to our regular business agenda. First, the consent agenda. Uh, minutes and various reports are posted on our website. Uh, I uh, call upon, uh, before uh, the other members of the senior leadership team, uh, I'll begin by uh, calling upon Provost Collins. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, President Schlissel, and good afternoon. It truly is a pleasure to tell the board and others who have joined this meeting about a number of initiatives that we are launching to address systemic racism. I'm very proud of the eagerness of our faculty, students, staff, and alumni that they bring to this work. They are deeply committed to finding paths that create an equitable society in which everyone can thrive. Today, I'll highlight just a few of the areas of work that we are undertaking. Building on our strong research and teaching on race and social justice, we will hire at least 20 new faculty members with expertise in social inequality and structural racism. We will develop a community engaged process for diversifying the names considered for campus spaces, facilities and streets. And in addition, we are evaluating the race and ethnicity cur curriculum requirements across the Ann Arbor schools and colleges. We are also creating a task force focused on public safety on the Ann Arbor campus that will draw our community together and will help us to determine ways to ensure that police and public safety and Provost Collins, your, your sound is going in and out again. If you could move closer to your mic and speak yes. a bit louder, we don't well, want to miss it. My anything. apologies. Uh, yeah. 
We are also creating a task force focused on public safety on the Ann Arbor campus that will draw our community together. It will help us to determine the best ways to ensure that our police and public safety programs and staff serve everyone in our community. And I am particularly excited to announce that we have established a George Floyd Memorial Scholarship Fund. It will provide need-based scholarships with preference going to the students who have participated in our Wolverine Pathways program, which helps students from Detroit, Southfield, and Ypsilanti prepare for college. Alumnus Marshall William has generously given a lead gift to establish the scholarship. And I encourage those who want to follow his lead to join me and visit the university's diversity webpage for more information about the fund and to consider making a contribution to it. These and other initiatives will help us to carry out our research, teaching, and service missions in ways that champion our values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Provost Collins. Uh, I particularly want to call out this George Floyd scholarship. It's a uh, uh, scholarships in George Floyd's honor are being developed in many universities around the country. I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, and I plan to devote some of my own personal philanthropy to the university, to this scholarship fund uh, this year and, and into the future. So thanks very much, uh, Provost Collins. Uh, I next call upon um, uh, uh, Executive Vice President Marshall Runge for the University of Michigan Health System Report. Marshall. Uh, thank you, President Schlissel. <clears throat> I'd like to give an update on COVID-19, both in general and as it impacts the University of Michigan and Michigan Medicine. The state of Michigan has seen a continuing rise in hospitalization levels over the past two weeks. Uh, this is the result of increased positive COVID cases. Uh, as of uh, October, on October 21st, there were almost 1,600 Michiganders who tested positive for COVID. Uh, this, is, uh, this trend is being seen across the state. Uh, of increasing hospitalizations, and that includes uh, increasing intensive care unit census, but not to the degree it was uh, back in March and April, at least not at present. Uh, the total hospitalizations actually are higher outside of Southeast Michigan uh, than within uh, Southeast Michigan. Our, our trend is the same. And uh, in late summer, early fall, we had a, a much lower census of COVID patients than we'd had in many months. We had in the hospital at any one time 10 to 12 patients. Uh, over the last uh, two weeks, our census has exceeded 20 patients. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the rise is uh, due to admissions through our emergency department uh, and largely of non-Washtenaw County residents. Uh, and I think this is a reflection that we serve not just our local community, but uh, much broader, uh, including across the state and some out-of-state patients. Uh, we've spent a lot of time preparing for a second wave of hospitalizations. We have a comprehensive plan that takes into account acute cluster outbreaks uh, where we're uh, prepared with, four, with 43 intensive care unit beds. Uh, if there is a major resurgence in hospitalizations, we'll activate, activate our regional intensive care unit, which we did last time, uh, which would bring our ICU total beds to 75. Uh, with regards to treatments, uh, we're using... Uh, uh, the latest in treatments, and uh, there has been a lot of progress uh, since March and April. We know much more about treating this disease. We can't uh, totally make it go away, but we can treat it better. We're using uh, remdesivir and corticosteroids, which have gotten pressed for uh, showing reduced hospitalizations and mortality. Uh, we have developed new programs uh, for caring for COVID patients to try to help them improve and not have to go to the in intensive care unit. And we still are using ECMO, uh, which is uh, external uh, uh, circulation for selected patients. Uh, we're working with other hospitals and with Blue Cross Blue Shield across the state to share best practices. Uh, we're also actively uh, involved in telemedicine and in innovative therapies. Our active three clinical trial is a high priority. It's uh, testing a number of different approaches and it's part of the NIH Operation Warp Speed Initiative. Uh, we're studying, uh, involved in studies in, of these new monoclonal antibodies that show great promise for reducing hospitalizations. Uh, those studies are in progress. And we're also involved in stage three, that's the most advanced clinical trials for two COVID vaccines. Uh, both are on hold right now as a result of adverse uh, 
reactions that are being investigated, but we expect to be back up and going soon. We uh, need to be prepared both uh, in, in all ways for what could be a significant increase in uh, COVID patients uh, from uh, potentially from our own campus, although uh, as President Schlissel has said before, the, uh, although the rate of infection in students has gone up, the rate of, rate of hospitalization is very low in that population. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rungi. Uh, I next call upon Chancellor Grasso for the Dearborn Campus Report. Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. Uh, I want to begin by sharing how pleased I am to report that since the start of classes on September 1st, we've had only nine positive cases of COVID on campus with only two of these individuals that had close contact with others on campus. Surely, this is a result of being the only fully commuter campus uh, in the state of Michigan. Hence, we were able to skew our curricular offerings to heavily remote this semester with only 8% of our courses on campus. This is important because many of our students travel and interact across multiple counties, sharing or sequestering their public health characteristics as the case may be. On another very positive note, after months of engaging with hundreds of faculty, staff, and students, conversing with invited, innovative, and nationally accomplished higher ed leaders, discussing ideas regarding our future in town halls and listening sessions, listening to feedback provided by our faculty and staff senates and our student government, and reviewing ideas submitted through a Think Big Request for Ideas solicitation. While navigating the global pandemic, we have arrived at our first set of initiatives that will guide our work for the coming years. Earlier this week, I shared a communication with the campus community outlining our initiatives, all geared toward our ultimate goal of student success. Among the centerpieces of our strategy is a redevelopment and restructuring of our financial aid approach, moving toward a more need-based philosophy to better, better emphasize accessibility. I'm very excited to go forward with our plan with vigor and continued input and guidance from our campus community. I am aware that there are several speakers in the public comment portion of today's meeting who wish to address our decision made last month to cancel sports in the winter semester with the caveat of reevaluating our decision in February and potentially resuming competition in March. I want to take a moment to share and contextualize the process and thinking that led to our decision. U of M Dearborn participates in the Wolverine Hoosier Athletic Conference of the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, the NAIA. About 4% of our student population, or 350 Dearborn students, participate in 16 sports. As a point of reference, the other members of our conference are private institutions, offer on-campus university-owned housing, and average about 43% student athletes. As I noted earlier, we do not have university-owned housing in Dearborn, and many of our students live throughout the Metro Detroit area and commute to schools, jobs, and other locations throughout the region. When we developed our fall 2020 academic plans, our goal was to minimize on-campus activity. Hence, only 8% of classes were offered on campus. No co-curricular activities, including sports, were allowed on campus. Consistent with our overall plan to keep students, faculty, and staff safe, on June 22nd, we canceled our intercollegiate activities and competitions, including sports, occurring in the fall semester, and announced that we would make a decision about winter sports by October 1st. It should be noted that after our decision about fall sports, the NAIA moved all fall sports to the spring. We announced the decision regarding winter sports on September 30th, again making the decision early to allow our student athletes, coaches and staff to prepare and plan appropriately. We also announced that we will maintain all athletic scholarships during this unfortunate time. I know sports and competition are important. I played sports. All of my children were student athletes and I coached AAU basketball for years. I have a deep appreciation and respect 
for the time our student athletes invest in their sports, their studies, and our university. To be sure, athletics teach discipline, sacrifice, perseverance, leadership, and of course, teamwork. Our coaches at U of M Dearborn foster those values, all of which are valuable life skills. Our decision regarding winter semester sports was very difficult and not taken lightly. This decision was a subject of many emotionally wrenching senior leadership discussions and driven by the objectives of health, safety, fairness, and consistency. Our fall teaching plan has our campus being 100% remote after Thanksgiving. No one will be allowed on campus except essential personnel. Our winter semester plan continues this remote status until March 1st. Other factors that led to or further support our decision include first, we do not have the medical supervision, testing, cleaning, disinfecting services, and sequestration or quarantining facilities that would be necessary to safely mount athletic programs protective of our students, staff, and local communities. Second, infection rates are rising steeply in Michigan and even more so in Indiana and Ohio, where some of our WAC conference competitions would take place. In, fastest, in fact, this past week saw some of the highest reported numbers of daily cases in all three states since the beginning of the pandemic. Third, as the great one, Wayne Gretzky, once noted, you want to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. We have kept a continuous eye on data, decisions, and trends. We felt that we knew where the puck was going. Our prescient conclusions were indeed ahead of the curve and ahead of many schools who are now starting to make similar decisions. Since U of M Dearborn's decision, NESCAC, the New, England, uh, the New England Small College Athletic Conference that comprises schools such as Amherst, Middlebury, and Williams, where Duncan Robinson first got his collegiate start, and the North, Co North Coast Athletic Conference, in including schools such as Oberlin, Kenyon and Denison, two powerhouse NCAA Division III conferences can canceled their winter seasons, as have a number of other individual institutions. We are always and continuously reflective, reflecting on and considering our decisions in light of new or changing information. But in this case, our decisions have only been reaffirmed by many universities across the nation. Finally, the NCAA Division I Council extended eligibility for student athletes by one year, seemingly in anticipation of a major disruption to the winter season. The actions we have taken regarding sports were difficult, but are in the best interest of protecting the health and well being of our students, faculty, staff, and community. We will reassess the situation in the early part of 2021, and I sincerely hope we can resume play, return. return to full in-person classes and restore all normal aspects of our lives. I do wanna thank all of our athletes and their coaches for their commitment, passion, and pride to their studies, sports, and university. And I look forward to the day when we can all watch them safely return and compete in the maze in blue. Go blue, go Dearborn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Grasso. Uh, for the Flint campus report, I uh, call upon Chancellor Dutta. Thank you, President Slishel. We do not have sports. Um, the fall semester has been good so far. We are about 10% on campus, and we are just hoping that the good luck continues in the winter semester. Considering the disruption caused by the pandemic, I would say things are going well moving forward at U of M, Flint. We are seeking, exploiting opportunities to evolve and grow. There is excitement and optimism at U of M Flint. I want to talk about a supplemental item request that is seeking board approval for the appointment of the inaugural Dean of the new College of Innovation and Technology. Following an internal search, Provost Fees Price and I are recommend, recommending Dr. Chris Pearson as the inaugural Dean. Dr. Pearson received his PhD from the University of Minnesota, and after a postdoc at UC Davis, he joined U of M Flint in 1998. He is currently a full professor in the Department of Computer Science, Engineering, and Physics, 
and since 2015 has been serving as the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. His candidacy marries deep institutional knowledge and relationships with a vision for technology education that I believe will position our CIT to produce graduates well prepared to join the workforce in manufacturing, biotechnology, AI, cybersecurity, and more. There's tremendous amount of work ahead to matriculate the first cohort next fall. We are working very hard as a team. I respectfully request the board's approval. The campus-wide DEI committee of faculty, staff, and students has made significant progress. They have developed a strategic plan, which was posted for public comments and now it has been finalized and we are moving to the implementation phase. I wanna particularly thank President Slichel for the financial support of our DEI initiative as part of the RRG funding from Ann Arbor. This support is very timely, thank you. Finally, our DEI work also resulted in the re-emergence of a very important concept, establishing a new institute the Urban Institute for Race, Economic and Environmental Justice at U of M Flint. As you all know, for quite some time, the city of Flint and many other communities across the nation have dealt with the adverse effects of race relations, economic downturns and environmental degradation. As a regional public university, U of M Flint can and has to do more. The Urban Institute will bring together the community members, faculty, staff, and students will create new knowledge through research and pilot results to make positive and sustainable contributions to our community. We are acutely aware that the futures of U of M Flint and the city of Flint are inextricably intertwined. Therefore, together, we must build a better future for all of us. It is with these hopes and aspirations that we are establishing the Urban Institute for Race, Economic and Environmental Justice at U of M Flint. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, we now move on to student government reports. Uh, first, I call upon Flint Student Government President, Samantha Upmore. Samantha. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, Schlissel, members of the Board of Regents and executive officers of the university, I wanted to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Samantha Upmore and I'm the student body president at the University of Michigan Flint. As we have tackled many of the obstacles placed before us regarding COVID-19 and the transition to mostly online learning, I'm proud to be able to say that the student government team at UM Flint has actively been working to accomplish our platform of engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sustainability. Our engagement goals are centered around student, civic, and community engagement, and thus far have been extremely successful. We launched phases one and two of our Flint First initiative, which is focused on the students of UM Flint giving back to the residents of the city. In September, we hosted a meal pickup for essential workers that helped over 300 families. Most recently, we organized a literature drop that reached 9,850 households in Flint with voting information. Both of these initiatives involve partnerships with community agencies and we're proud to be engaged in the city we call home. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion platform point has resulted in a new executive board position that will exclusively work on these issues that pertain to the topic. Currently, we have an active seat on the university-wide DEI committee and we're working to help ensure the voices of all students are represented. Finally, our sustainability platform has so far focused on institutional growth. Working with our administrators, as well as the One University Coalition, we were able to bring telehealth and student legal service pilot programs to our campus. These programs have incredible potential to enhance the student experience at the University of Michigan Flint. Finally, I would like to thank you for your investment in the Flint and Dearborn campuses. The opportunities the additional RRG funding has allowed us to provide our fellow Wolverines with is new and exciting. But with that being said, I implore you all to consider to continue investing in these campuses and supporting the students that do not attend the Ann Arbor campus. Our students live up to and often exceed the expectations of being leaders and best. We have already made great strides and with support from you, I know that progress will only continue to grow as we work together to continue to improve UM Flint. Thank you all for your time today. And as always, go blue. 
Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, we next call upon CSG Vice President Severi Nandagama. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we've got you now. Please go ahead. President Pushful, executive officers, and members of the Board of Regents, thank you for providing CSG with the opportunity to speak today. For those of you who I have not met, my name is Sveri Nandigama, and I'm the student body vice president in Ann Arbor. Students are now in the full swing of midterms across all three campuses. While this is ordinarily a very stressful time, we have heard from dozens of students about the increased stressors of this pandemic, the economic recession, family and friends, the lack of increased mental health resources in response to online learning, the increased time this have to spend on schoolwork, and an incredible selection season, to name a few. With football approaching, unfortunately, we all have to prepare for the reality that hundreds of more students will test positive for COVID as a result of this event. This will not change unless football is postponed, if not canceled. Given this recent stay at home order and many students already in quarantine and isolation housing, we strongly believe that the university needs to enact an opt in past no record COVID grading system for this semester, the winter 2020 semester. In addition, as we look towards winter 2021, students should be guaranteed one week, which would have been spring break, where there are no exams or high stakes assignments for our classes. We are incredibly stressed and overwhelmed with the effects of this pandemic, as I'm sure you all have been as well. I want to thank you for all of your leadership while urging you to continue caring for us. This year is unprecedented in many ways, and students need equally unprecedented forms of support. In response to the pandemic, CSG is providing $100 Instacart gift cards to students, held an Instagram Q&A with the incredible Drs. Emily Martin and Dr. Marissa Eisenberg, which reached over 600 people, and has committed to donating at least $5,000 towards the COVID-19 Dean of Students Emergency Fund. We are also announcing our free graduation gown distribution program, subsidization of group X passes, and continued voting messaging as we approach election day. We hope to work with you all in continuing to support students and are more than happy to speak about collaborating with any of you after. Finally, I want to end with a recognition that the Office of Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs is hosting celebrations for Native American Heritage Month right now in Ann Arbor. The university was able to be built in Ann Arbor because Indigenous nations provided their land to us. It is my hope that we can honor our promises to these nations, recognizing the ways in which we have been complicit in indigenous oppression, striving to serve indigenous people better. Thank you and go blue. Thank you very much, Saveri. Um, the, uh, there are personnel reports, but they're in the materials as are some retirement memoirs uh, this month. Uh, I now call for a vote on the consent agenda, including the supplemental personnel item for the Flint campus. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Support. Thank you for the second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, please raise your hand. Very good. Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. The consent agenda uh, passes and we now move on to the regular agenda, uh, finance and property. Uh, the first is an info item, uh, but uh, we have uh, uh, the adoption of financial statements, Vice President Hegarty. Yes, Mr. President, as we heard from Regent Bernstein, the university's independent accountants, PricewaterhouseCoopers, has completed its audit of the consolidated financial statements of the university. Uh, the audit identified no fraud, no material errors, and, and no misstatements, and has again earned the university a clean audit opinion. I recommend to the board adoption of the university's consolidated audited financial statements for fiscal year 2020. Uh, thank you, is there a motion? So moved. So moved, so moved. Uh, th Thank you, I heard a second as well. Thank you, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. Uh, the next item is internal merger of Metro Health Corporation into U of M Health and related actions, Vice President Rungi. Thank you, on behalf of Michigan Medicine and Metro Health Corporation, we are recommending to move forward and approve the merger of Metro Health Corporation into UM Health to achieve governance effectiveness and efficiency. This merger will enable more agile decision-making across the entire Michigan medicine system. 
in support of our mission, vision, and values and organizing principles. At completion, the Board of Metro Hospital will serve as the one primary governing board of Metro. I'd like to thank the Board of Regents and the UMHS board for their thoughtful counsel and support throughout this merger planning process. Uh, thank you, Vice President Rungi. Uh, is there a motion? So move. Support. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Very good. The motion carries. Uh, items 4 through 25 are conflict of interest items, each of which requires six votes for approval. The regents have carefully reviewed all of these items and will consider them together as a block in one vote unless any regent requests individual consideration of or recusal from voting on a particular item. Uh, does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on items four through 25. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, nope. Second. Very good, there's a motion and a second. Uh, I'd now like to uh, uh, actually call the roll in this case. Uh, and uh, as I call your name, please indicate your vote on this uh, uh, items four through 25. Uh, Regent Acker? Aye. Regent Beam? Aye. Regent Bernstein? Aye. Regent Brown? Aye. Regent Diggs? Yes. Regent Illich? Aye. Regent Weiser? Yes. And Regent White? Aye. Uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, um, uh, conflict of interest items pass. Uh, we now move forward. Approval of a U of M Flint Senate bylaws. Uh, Chancellor Dutta? Thank you, President Social. Um, as you know, the U of M Flint um, did not have, to the best of our knowledge, including the research done by um, the Secretary's office, a regentally approved bylaws. Um, this semester, we are operating without a bylaws, but a transition model is in place that is very similar to the bylaws that are being proposed. The Transition Faculty Senate Council and the Provost and I, we have come together with a joint statement, which I want to read for you. The first regentally approved bylaws will be a historic milestone for U of M Flint. The Transition Faculty Senate Council joins me in thanking both the task force members whose good work led to these bylaws and the U of M Flint faculty who overwhelmingly voted to support it. With your approval, U of M Flint will have a new model for shared governance. We, that is the Transition Faculty Senate Council and administration are working collaboratively on the plans for its implementation, united by our conviction that U of M Flint is an essential institution for transforming the lives of students we serve and its best years are ahead. So with, um, with the support of the Transition Faculty Council and U of M Flint faculty, I respectfully request your approval of this proposed bylaws. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So what I'm gonna do is call for a motion in a second and then there are a, a couple of regents that want to make uh, comments or discuss. Uh, so is there a motion to approve the bylaws? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Very good. I'll first call upon Regent Brown and then I believe Regent Beam wished to make comments. Regent Brown? Yes, thank you. Uh, Chancellor, I agree with you that Flint's best days are ahead and I just want to congratulate you, um, your administration and faculty for uh, the success and I know the hard work it takes to create these things and then of course reaching consensus on them is maybe even harder than developing them 
Um, I think it's going to go a long way in uh, allowing uh, your office and the administration to work collaboratively um, with faculty to grow uh, uh, the admissions rate into uh, U of M Flint. So congratulations. Uh, thank you, Regent Brown. Uh, Regent Beam. Yeah, I'd like to echo uh, what Regent Brown said. Mark, uh, congratulations, Chancellor Dunn. Uh, this is great news. Uh, I think that the new bylaws should really help uh, U of M Flint's administration and faculty uh, work together to create new uh, programs and opportunities uh, for all of our students. Congrats. Thank you very much. Other comment or discussion? Okay, uh, I now call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Uh, thank you very much. The uh, new Flint Senate bylaws have been approved. Uh, I now will turn things over to Vice President and Secretary uh, Churchill uh, to manage the public comment section of our Regents meeting. Uh, Sally, it's on to you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will um, be introducing each of our speakers one at a time and they will be unmuted. They've all checked in. As far as I know, they're all here today, all 15 speakers. Because we have 15 speakers, we have a limit of up to three minutes per speaker and ask that you stay within that time. Uh, you should understand that the topics you will be raising may require analysis and study on the part of the chancellors, the executive officers, the regents, the president. So they may not necessarily respond to your comments today, but they certainly will be listening and taking them under consideration. So I will start with our first speaker today because we do have a number and that is Lisa Karen Gatto. Hello, my name is Lisa Karen Gatto. I have been teaching piano as a Leo lecturer too with the University of Michigan Dearborn for 13 years. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. When I joined the Dearborn Music faculty in 2006, there was a piano lab and practice room consisting of nine keyboards. My first semester, I taught two, two sections of piano twice a week with six students per class at a beginning or advanced level. The piano program quickly grew to five sections with a consistent average enrollment of 27 to 30 students per semester. Of those students, many enrolled in piano for two, three, and even four semesters. All of the yearly evaluations and weekly personal interactions with students makes it clear that applied music relieves academic stress and strongly supports curricular integration. Piano classes can easily be taught virtually. Not ideal, of course, but still very effective. Since March 23rd, I've been giving Zoom piano lessons to my private students with much success. I've devised ways of providing music, assignment, and graded theory sheets, plus a musical guidance that affords them advancement in their playing abilities, listening, and understanding of a musical structure and genres. When the university locked down on March 11th, considerable work went into making immediate structural teaching changes. College students with keyboards at home received one-on-one -on -one instruction from me to complete the winter semester and actually gained equal educational experience as if we were still in the lab. By July, class enrollment for fall piano classes was already strong at 14 students out of a possible 24. Previous years had begun with fewer, but reached capacity by the second week of the semester. Yet when I went to submit my complete and revised virtual syllabi prior to the July 13th deadline, I received the message that all piano classes had been canceled. This news was devastating. In addition to teaching, I spent 13 years ensuring that Dearborn piano students had the best possible educational setting by taking excellent care of our nine keyboards, pedals, headsets, cords, and wiring that were intricately taped and bound in both piano rooms. In August, without my knowledge or oversight, all of this equipment was removed. The actions of Castle in canceling piano classes and dismantling keyboards represent a serious impairment to the continuation of music at Dearborn. Students need diverse elective courses. Piano and music courses actively cultivate creativity and skills that have far reaching applications for student productivity and their overall personal and professional successes. We the music faculty request that the piano program be reinstated as a cornerstone of quality music education on the Dearborn campus. 
We're also asking alongside other lecturers to meet with the Dearborn and Flint Regents Committee to discuss what's happening on our campuses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is um, Michael Mashawar. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, my name is Michael Mashawar and I recently graduated from the University of Michigan Dearborn. Roughly two weeks ago, I was contacted by my former piano instructor, not only about the state of applied music in the middle of a pandemic, but also about the blatant disregard that the university administration has for their faculty. This of course is nothing new considering the way the University of Michigan treats their striking employees. I'm not speaking today just to shame this university system. I'm speaking today in solidarity with the music department at Dearborn for whom I can thankfully credit for brightening up two semesters during my undergraduate program. I'm not here to tell you all the great and important benefits that music can have on an education all benefits that are supported again and again through research. As leaders of an academic institution, you should be aware of the significance of music. Instead, I want to take a moment to thank my applied music instructors at U of M Dearborn. I took two classes with the applied music department, piano and guitar. Biology is a difficult and demanding STEM major. And given that I spent at least half of my study time alone playing my instrument every week, I would avoid doing my coursework just to practice and play the music I was learning. This is because my piano instructor helped me to believe in myself and my ability, encouraging me and motivating me to play music that I never thought I would be able to play at my level, like Beethoven and Debussy. This was a level of self-exploration and expression that I could never experience in my STEM classes and that I still consider to have been invaluable. Thank you, Professor Karen Gatto. The applied music instructors at Dearborn are incredible and it's clear that they are taken for granted. It was disturbing to hear that music classrooms are being dismantled by the university without permission or even consultation from the already underfunded music department. It is disappointing to hear that, an inter that during an international crisis, there is less transparency than ever at the University of Michigan Dearborn. As an alumnus, you can imagine my embarrassment when I hear about the tone deaf whites only cafe to have conversations on race while the country is in uproar about black Americans being lynched in the streets. And then I hear that the music department is being deconstructed without even a word of notice. All of this is not only intolerable, but inhumane. Lecturers rely on these classes for a living, for their income, and students honestly rely on them for their sanity. From a student perspective, these moves to deprioritize or even abolish the piano and guitar programs are despicable. Unfortunately, it needs to be said, your faculty do not deserve this. Your faculty are the foundation of this institution and without them, the University of Michigan could not function. Your faculty and your students deserve transparency. We know that the administration can support Dearborn and Flint with additional funding. You've opened the door to sustaining Dearborn and Flint and we would like you to carry that message to help the chancellors understand that they have more support they can rely on. I'm standing with the faculty and asking that the Dearborn and Flint Regents Committee meet, meet with lecturers for them to learn what is going on in Flint and Dearborn campuses and in asking that you restore the cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Flagg. Hello, distinguished regents and governing officers. I have been teaching music history and theory courses in Castle since January 2010. I've come to you today to discuss what I believe to be short-sighted and damaging cuts to the applied music program at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Music is an integrative discipline. Our music history courses contribute to the disciplines of anthropology, history, social sciences, journalism and screen studies, psychology, women's studies, and even math and engineering. Our classes are filled with students from across these disciplines. In fact, our applied music courses are predominantly populated by engineering students. Applied piano functions as a key foundational class within the music department. Similar to labs in chemistry, biology, physics, and other sciences, the applied piano class brings students a hands-on understanding of how music works as a science. And there are important real-world applications for piano skills. Keyboards are used to input notation when writing or editing music for film, 
television or video, to design and input music for computer games, and to help bring about a deeper understanding of music theory. In all of these ways, the piano course has important applications within the career goals of our students. The cuts in question seem to be based on two misperceptions. First, applied piano is seen to contribute, not to contribute to general university education. Second, students can pursue applied music at the Ann Arbor campus. Having earned my PhD at the music school in Ann Arbor, I can confirm that the purpose of applied music classes there is vastly different than it is on our campus. Ann Arbor has a music school whose mandate is to train professional musicians for a lifelong career in music. Here in Dearborn, applied music is meant to be part of a student's overall training. Applied music develops the mind. From my 35 years of experience as a guitar and piano teacher, I've observed that students who learn to play an instrument learn the intellectual discipline and patience required to master any field they wish to pursue. Playing piano develops hand-eye coordination, oral visual integration. These integrate left and right hemispheres of the brain. Music performance helps students develop confidence and effective presentation skills. All of these skills, once learned through a keyboard class, can then be applied to other disciplines within a student's undergraduate experience. Students who have taken piano all attest to its value in their intellectual development. We, the music faculty, request that the piano program be reinstated as a cornerstone of quality music education on the Dearborn campus. We're also asking to meet with Dearborn and Flint Regions Committee to discuss what's happening on our campuses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Brianna Kruger. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Brianna Kruger. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I'm a fourth year student at the University of Michigan Dearborn, and I'm a member of the One University Coalition. There has been a lack of authentic community involvement in strategic planning efforts implemented by Chancellor Grasso at UMD. The offered town halls, online forums, and listening sessions with university administration have, been elic have elicited symbolic student participation rather than equitable decision making with university leaders to address our campus's issues and create solutions for them. For example, this has been reflected by the LGBTQ plus community being moved from their space on campus during the fall 2019 semester into the Center for Social Justice and Inclusion without any prior warning, where many no longer feel safe and now fear sharing their lived experiences on campus. The segregated virtual conversation cafes for students, one cafe for black and indigenous students, people of color and other minority students, Another cafe for non-people of color also highlights the lack of student involvement at Dearborn. Although these cafes were intended to foster a space for students to discuss their lived experiences and struggles on campus, they were organized without any input from the many diversity, equity, and inclusion or social activism student organizations that we have at U of M Dearborn, creating further irreparable, I'm sorry, irreparable damage to U of Dearborn's minority students that could have been avoided. Furthermore, despite the sexual assault training that students are required to complete every year, several of my peers and others in the community have been victim blamed, invalidated, or punished by university leadership for speaking up about sexual assault and harassment at Dearborn. When decisions are made with the community rather than for the community, we can truly achieve the goal that Chancellor Grasso set during his inauguration of making a profound difference through collective action, creativity, and determined effort. However, some of these differences cannot be made without providing continued and sustainable funding to the Dearborn and Flint communities in order to decrease the institutional barriers that a majority of Dearborn and Flint students face. Chancellor Grasso is unwilling to even consider something like a Go Blue guarantee for Dearborn because of his understanding of the recent funds from Ann Arbor as short term. In Flint, the stakeholders were called together and unanimously supported a Go Blue guarantee but again, because of President Slershel's lack of commitment for sustainable and long-term investment, Flint and Dearborn students will lose that opportunity while a majority of the university bank is, interest is invested in Ann Arbor. The $20 million investment in Dearborn and Flint was a step in the right direction towards equity, 
decreasing the wealth disparity between the campuses and lowering the systematic barriers that many Dearborn and Flint students face. But we need the commitment of the regents and this administration to a long-term investment in our campuses. We are asking the Dearborn and Flint Regents Committee to meet with the One University students to talk about our experiences on our campus. We would like to work together to address these issues, and it is essential that our university creates opportunities opportunities for the democratic involvement of students and faculty. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tom Sellers. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Sellers and my son Reed is a student athlete at the Dearborn campus studying secondary education and participating in men's basketball. I'm representing parents of the men's basketball team to comment on Chancellor Grasso's decision to cancel all winter sports for the Dearborn campus. As a parent group, we were frustrated by the process used by the Dearborn administration to make this decision, which has been opaque at best up to this point in time. When Chancellor Grasso announced this decision, it was done so with little or no input from the athletes who are directly impacted. How can it be that a university that prides itself on the intellectual prowess and curiosity of its students not include those same students in such a life-altering decision. We have asked Chancellor Grasso to meet with us to discuss in greater detail, but only received a stock response to our inquiry. We have reached out to President Schlissel and all the regions, but have received no feedback. I'm sure many of you are parents with children involved in sports or other activities. You would be equally frustrated by this lack of response and transparency. In his various comments on the subject, Chancellor Grasso has cited publicly available data on the spread of coronavirus as the reason for eliminating on-campus activities. However, all the data shows the positivity rate for coronavirus has stayed below the CDC's 5% threshold in Michigan's Region 1 response zone. The last time our region's seven-day average eclipsed that mark was early May. Furthermore, guidance provided by the state of Michigan allows for contact sports to be played given the proper safety guidelines. It's the reason why sports are being played at every level across the state, including youth, high school, and collegiate athletics. All Dearborn high schools are actively engaged in athletics right now, and the MHSAA will announce their plan for winter sports later this week. It's expected this plan will include practices beginning in November with an eye towards games being played by the end of December. Wayne State, Detroit Mercy, Madonna, and Lawrence Tech are all universities located in the Region 1 response zone, and all are currently preparing for their upcoming winter sports seasons. Not to mention that basketball practice is underway at the Ann Arbor campus and football will be playing their first game in two days. The Dearborn campus website states that 12% of students are attending a class on campus and the administration has implemented protocols to handle the screening and safety of those in attendance. How is it then that we have given up on Dearborn athletics without even trying to be successful? How is it that a university system that employs some of the brightest minds in the country is unwilling to apply the insights and knowledge they've gained through the restarting of sports in Ann Arbor at the Dearborn campus? How is it that a university system which has told the world that Michigan is the leaders and best is unwilling to attack this challenge in the same way their very students approach their athletic endeavors? We still have time to save the season, but if we don't act soon, our window of opportunity will have passed us by. Waiting until February to consider a March restart date is too late as the entire NAIA and Wolverine Hoosier Athletic Conference winter sports season will be almost complete. We are asking that Chancellor Grasso reconsider his decision to cancel athletic activities and honor our request to meet with members of the athletic department, student athletes and their parents to create a path forward for the resumption of winter sports. Thanks for your time. And we look forward to future engagement on a plan to restart athletics. Thank you. I'd now call on Michael Bohannon. Michael? Sally, I'm sorry to report that he has dropped off the call. He has dropped off. Okay. Did he tell you he was dropping off or should I check check in again at the end of the list? Please check in again at the end of the list. Okay. Just so everybody knows, if we lose somebody, we do try to uh, have them rejoin before the end of the meeting, but at the end, just to keep the flow going. So then I will call on our next speaker who is very raft. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Hello all, thank you for allowing me to speak at this meeting. My name is Very Oliver Raft and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. 
I'm a senior at U of M Dearborn and serve as the secretary for the 1U Dearborn organization. I want to start by saying that I'm not here to insult, target, or place blame on any single person or group. However, there are some aspects of my academic journey that I want to highlight because I want to feel proud to graduate from University of Michigan this December. My intentions are to provide my educational experience and push for a better change for current and future students. This semester is very different from past semesters. In my personal experience, I had a significant surgery in September. I have been living in motels and hotels for the past month because I don't have a permanent address, and I have been completing my schoolwork in coffee shops and hotel lobbies. On top of this, my on-campus job reduced our hours to six per week, and my professor has been unable to secure funding to hire me as a TA. I want to bring this to the attention of the university leadership because I truly don't understand why my tuition would increase during the COVID-19 pandemic, yet my campus job would cut our hours and there's no funding to employ students, all while U of M has an endowment of over $12 billion. This reflects a failure of the university system. I know that the CARES Act has been helpful for short-term emergencies, but it was provided from the federal government for the explicit purpose of addressing student concerns. How do we know that the University of Michigan would have supported us financially in this time if federal CARES funding didn't exist? My friends at the Dearborn campus have also experienced struggles. Many of my friends experienced job loss from their on and off campus jobs and have not been supported directly from the university. The strategic plan is failing. I do not see it as a viable strategy to reduce student employment options, remove safe spaces for LGBTQ plus and by POC students and refuse to listen to student input. U of M Flint has started moving in the right direction by creating a committee of students and faculty to give input on spending their portion of the $20 million investment. They've also announced that they will be extending health and legal services to their students. However, in Dearborn, students like myself and my friends are continuing to struggle. Do we not deserve these services too? We're asking that this administration show its support for students of Dearborn and Flint by committing to a long-term investment in funding for the Go Blue Guarantee, DEI initiatives, health and legal services. We're asking that the region's Dearborn and Flint Governance Committee meet with the One University students to talk about our experiences on our campuses and implement student voices. We're asking that Dearborn make a commitment to provide genuine inclusion in the decision-making process of the university. Thank you for this opportunity. I yield my time. Thank you, Barry. Our next speaker is Danielle Harbin. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Danielle Harbin. I'm in my ninth year as a lecturer in the biology department at U of M Flint. Last time I talked to you was during Leo's last contact, contract negotiations. I was concerned that my full-time salary would not be enough to support myself and my daughter if I left my unhealthy marriage. Thank you for your support during our last negotiations. Due to our hard work and your support, I am almost able to fully support myself and my daughter while working full-time. After rent subsidized by my mother, childcare, utilities, and food, I am left with zero dollars at the end of each month. Anything else I need for myself or my daughter comes from my family members and my dwindling savings. The university and you all still have an obligation to do more. I lecture, the lecture I teach in the fall semester has nearly 200 students, generating over $400,000 in the one semester in tuition alone. Without my teaching and the teaching of fellow lecturers, the university would have no product to sell their students. Despite the fact that the university hasn't shown that lecturers deserve to be paid a living wage. We are extremely dedicated to our students, especially during this COVID time. I spent my entire summer planning, collaborating, researching, and training to prepare for online fall semester. I paid nearly $2,000 in childcare so I could prepare my course. I paid to work for you. My fellow lecturers also put in countless hours of free work this summer and were repaid with over 41% of Flint lecturers who lost work, over 30% who lost benefits and eligibility. These are not just percentages, they are real people who have dedicated their lives to teaching and they were dropped as if they didn't matter. I have two quick email quotes from students, one from a homeschooling mother. 
with an autistic child going through a COVID scare that said, thank you, your passionate and beautifully organized lectures are the bright spot in my life. Another from a student on a Monday morning who knew she could count on me to have my materials up. One to take a moment to thank me for the hard work you're putting in. Even through a screen, I can tell how much you care. Lectures are dedicated to giving our students the best possible education. Despite this, we were hit with unnecessary and harmful layoffs. Our wealthy university can afford to make better choices for Flint and Dearborn. You've already begun to open the door for us. Please continue to do so. We ask the Dearborn and Flint Governance Committee meet with lecturers and students to learn what is happening. Lectures are essential and stepped up to keep the lights on when you needed us. Consider what kind of education you want for the students and can you achieve this without us? Please reverse these cuts. I'll end this with how I began my speech three years ago. I love what I do. Being able to teach, guide, and inspire students brings me such joy. I'm proud to teach at the University of Michigan Flint. What I don't understand is why the University of Michigan is not proud of me and will not pay me a living wage. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Brooke uh, Spiegel. Hi, my name is Brooke Spiegel and I'm a student athlete at the University of Michigan Dearborn. I'm on the women's golf team as well as the captain of the women's ice hockey team. But today I'm representing all my fellow student athletes as their student athlete advisory council president. I wanna take the time to thank all of you for allowing me the opportunity to speak at this meeting and I hope you will take what I say into consideration. I also wanna thank all the student athletes watching right now and to everyone who is supporting us through this difficult time. On September 30th, our athletes went on a Zoom meeting with their coaches at noon, only to be told that we would have no sports until March 1st. An hour after that, Chancellor Grasso made the announcement to the public. However, there has been no minimal, there has been minimal direct conversations between student athletes and the chancellor thus far. Moving forward, we hope we can receive better communication and have conversations about access to resources. I am unsure if any of you are, have been a student athlete, but I can attest to the fact that it truly becomes your life. Now imagine having that part of your identity taken away. I can speak from personal experience that it is a difficult situation to handle, especially considering all the time and work you put, have put into it. On and off the ice court and field, we are leaders who excel in the classroom, serve our local community and have a strong presence within our campus as well. From my experience, my commitment to the university in 2018 has given me many opportunities from being a dual sport collegiate athlete, holding leadership roles, as well as being named a 2020 Dearborn Difference Maker. We come from different places, even internationally, all bringing different stories. But the one thing that we all have in common is that athletics is what brought us to the University of Michigan Dearborn. And we would like the chance to put on our uniforms and represent the university as a Wolverine in competition. We do understand that we are in the middle of a pandemic and the seriousness of COVID-19, but we also believe that we should be given the opportunity to return safely by following protocols. We may not be an NCAA campus and may be considered a commuter campus, but there are different levels that have safely returned to play, including youth sports. As athletes, we are disciplined and devoted to our sports, and I know we would follow guidelines set in place. We hope that with further consideration, the March 1st date could be moved to a sooner date, such as January 1st. As SAC president and captain of a team, I understand the challenging decisions leaders have to make for the good of their people, but I hope this can create a reconsideration and allow further conversations. On behalf of all U of M Dearborn student athletes, I want to thank you all again for allowing our voices to be heard. Thank you, go Blue and go Dearborn. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now, <clears throat> excuse me, call on Jalen Paul. Good evening. My name is Jalen Paul, and I'm a captain on the men's basketball team at UM Dearborn. While other presenters have and will discuss the scientific and logistical reasons why the University of Michigan Dearborn should reopen the field house, allow practices, and reinstate the winter sports season, I'm going to discuss the realistic and human consequences of canceling athletic events until March 1st. I want to start by telling a little bit about myself first. When I was born and my parents were allowed to take me home from the hospital, the first place I went was not home, but rather a basketball game at the University of St. Francis in Fort Wayne, Indiana. At the time, my grandfather was a head women's basketball coach at St. Francis. My father was also an assistant coach in these teams. So as you can imagine, I was in the gym a lot, practically raised in it. My grandfather and father eventually made the jump from St. Francis IPFW, now known as PFW, a Division I institution across town. This move allowed me to see basketball from a whole new level, sitting on the bench, traveling to gyms such as Mackey Arena at Purdue and the Breslin Center at Michigan State, 
and sitting next to some of the top coaches in the world on the sidelines at recruiting events. I was surrounded by the game of basketball at all times, and I fell in love with it. From an early age, everything I did was because of basketball. Friends, enemies, social functions, you name it. The first high school I went to was a private school. And as you can probably assume at this point, I went there for basketball. At the end of my junior year of high school, my father was fired, or contract non-renewed, as he likes to tell people, from IPFW. Due to IPFW being my childhood, it hurt me probably more than it hurt him. With that being said, he took the head coaching job at a small podunk high school just outside of Fort Wayne, Indiana, called Sarah Roscoe. A little hole in the wall that few people outside the town cared about. Well, it was the best year of my life, and somewhere I still call home this day. It's where all my friends are. It's where most of my memories have been made. You're probably asking how that relates at all to anything we were talking about, but here's how it does. I wouldn't have any of this without basketball. My friends would be different. My memories would be different. And frankly, I would be different. My passion for basketball is why I am the person I am today. It is why I put in countless hours improving my game and sacrifice countless social events with friends. I've given my life to the game. I think this is important to bring up because I know a large majority of the athletes here at UM Dearborn who have, been, who have been affected by this decision share a similar background. We all love the sports we play. We don't play our sports as intramurals. We play them as college athletes. We have all made numerous sacrifices to come represent UM Dearborn by playing sports here. While Dearborn is a great academic institution, a vast majority of athletes had opportunities to study at more prestigious universities. Most athletes had opportunities to play sports at other schools as well. However, we all chose Dearborn because this is where we want to be. We want to play the sports we love for the coaches we love here at Dearborn. I'm a senior who is starting law school in the fall. If this decision stands, I am done with my basketball career. It is over, and I know there are a good amount of athletes throughout the Dearborn campus who are in the same situation. All we are asking as athletes is to let us have the opportunity to prove that we can compete in a safe and healthy manner like every other NAI institution in the country. We as athletes believe this decision is too important and too impactful on our lives for it to be made as a unilateral decision by Chancellor Grasso. We need your help. Please let us go out in the right way, playing the sports we love and ending our careers on our own terms. Trust us, just like you are trusting the student athletes just 37 miles away in Ann Arbor to be responsible and protect ourselves, our coaching staffs, and our families. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jalen Paul. I'm sorry, that was Jalen. I apologize. Henry uh, Luke Lane. Hello, everybody. My name is Henry Laukinen. I'm a student athlete at University of Michigan Dearborn. I represent the men's ice hockey team, and also I am the former student athlete at advisory council president. Um, so I want to thank Brooke and Jalen for. Um, more of a emotional response to this, but I want to talk more logic um, and how we can return safely um, for a January 1st date. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is what University of Michigan means to me. Um, so we have excellence, we have research, and we are a leader in the United States. That is something that the M logo represents. So why not with all those things, create a way that we can return um, safely in Dearborn. If that is masks, temperature checks, uh, logging of who goes in and out of buildings, sanitation, uh, uh, mandatory or given lock rooms, uh, COVID screenings, we already have mandatory drug screenings. So something like a two week interval COVID screen could also help us return in that positive manner. Um, another thing that has been on our minds as athletes is uh, the mental health aspect. No mental health resources have been given to us um, through the higher ups at our university. Everything has been student driven. Um, we've actually had to work with our athletic director ourselves in order to get a sports psychologist on campus, which I know Ann Arbor has a resource too. Um, so if it's something that Ann Arbor can do, why not us? I understand that our university was given funds from Ann Arbor to help us through things. Why not use those? I know smaller college campuses in our conference are playing that have fewer resources than us and they're doing it safely. So why not us? That's why I'm coming to you today, why not us? Everybody else around us is playing. Um, yes, testing is up, so COVID cases look like they're on the rise, but that is to the increase of testing. Um, so I wanna just come to you guys and say, why not us? 
we deserve a chance to put on that uniform, especially to our seniors, where it might be their last season of competition and they're gone. Um, so go blue. And I hope that we get a chance to represent you guys January 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Now we've got Chip Smith. Hi, can you hear me, Sally? Yeah, hi, Chip. We know How you. are you? Good, <laughs> good evening, friends. Uh, my name's Chip Smith. I'm a proud alum of the university. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor, and I am a sitting member of Ann Arbor City Council. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you tonight. I'd like to begin with a reminder that context matters in policy decisions. The University of Michigan is inextricably li linked to the city of Ann Arbor and to Washtenaw County. All of these actors impact the other. My ask of this body this evening is to keep the context of the university's location in mind as you make policy decisions that have impacts beyond the boundaries of campus. I would like to address two areas where regional cooperation is essential and in which the university's response has not met the standards that we have come to expect from the University of Michigan. The first area is in carbon neutrality. The city and county have adopted visions for achieving carbon neutrality by 2030. The city's plan called A20 is bold, ambitious, potentially transformative and relies on regional partners for success. The A20 plan was developed in less than six months in a fully transparent process which had massive stakeholder input and was adopted unanimously by city council last spring. Here at the university, the president's commission on carbon neutrality has extended their deadline for reporting recommendations on how to achieve net zero emissions to February, 2021. I fully expect this delay is so that the recommendations are robust, transformative and demonstrative of being the leaders in the best. The second area where the university needs to do a better job of working with your city and county partners is in the response to COVID-19. The community has spoken loudly and at length about their concern over the university's response to COVID. The community consensus is that the university's decision to resume in-person undergraduate classes with limited testing and inadequate enforcement protocols was the wrong decision and that this decision has harmed the community. Specifically, it has harmed our Ann Arbor public school children. School age children are the ones most in need of in-person instruction to foster social and academic development and to create the foundation for lifelong learning. Ann Arbor Public Schools has established data-driven criteria for resuming in-person instructions. The out, uh, instruction, the outbreaks attributed to the university community have driven the numbers to levels well above the targets that AAPS has set as requirements for resuming in-person instruction. We need you to work with AAPS. We need your help to bring these numbers down so that our children can go back to school. Reducing the university population infection rates is critical to achieving those targets. This fall has demonstrated that the university's approach to testing and enforcement isn't working. Ann Arbor's children need in-person instruction more than the undergraduate students do. Thanks for listening this evening, and as always, go blue. Thank you, Chip. Um, I believe Regent Bernstein was going to wishes to make a comment. Chip, I just wanted to say, Chip, thank um, it's uh, you've served five years on the Ann Arbor City Council. Um, and I just want to thank you for your intelligent service, your high integrity service and your impact on my community. Um, and uh, Ann Arbor is a better place because you have uh, served on our council. And um, it's, uh, I, I'm gonna miss you on, on Ann Arbor City Council. I thank you for everything you've done for our community. He was probably muted, but I'm sure he's saying thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know, but. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Somangshu uh, Mukari. Hi, uh, uh, thank you so much Regents uh, for giving me the chance to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Sam Mukherjee. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of music theory at the University's School of Music, Theater and Dance. I was hoping to draw your attention to the appeal I, uh, I filed recently on the provost's decision to deny me tenure and promotion to the rank of associate professor. I have provided you with materials to support this appeal, including 30 letters of reference from prominent faculty and administrators inside and outside the university. 
these materials demonstrate that my tenure case more than satisfies the objective requirements for tenure. So I was hoping not to dwell on this any further right now, but instead draw your attention to two aspects of my case that I find especially troubling. As the Regents bylaws and the university's policies make clear, the tenure process at the university is one that is intended to be clear, transparent, and relational, providing every faculty member with a fair and equal opportunity to secure tenure. I arrived at the university in 2013 with degrees from Princeton and Oxford, the latter of where I was a Rhodes Scholar. Since 2013, up until April of this year, I had been provided clear standards and requirements from my department and the university, and had satisfied all of them and even exceeded most of them. That this seven year process could be upended at the last minute based on a secretive, non-transparent parallel tenure review conducted within the provost's office itself is not only inconsistent with the bylaws and policies of the university, but should be a matter of grave concern to anyone in the university community who believes in transparency, due process, and fair play. It is problematic more so that this secretive, non-transparent tenure process is being used to deny tenure to a minority faculty member such as myself, who is otherwise objectively qualified. I have spent a great portion of my career working to help diversify my field of music scholarship, which has long been dominated by white males focused on Western music. I've done this through my teaching and scholarship, which focuses on non-Western music and cultures, and through activities that is serving as a diversity chair for the largest music theory organization in the nation. I'm the chair of the Society for Music Theory's Committee on Race and Ethnicity. However, the actions of the, of the provost convey a message that a minority male scholar such as myself is not welcome at the university, no, ma no matter what his accomplishments. It is my sincere hope that this is not the case. And I ask that the regents take action on my appeal to ensure that this will not be the lasting legacy of my time here at the University of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Wayne Petty. Good evening, Regents. My name is Wayne Petty. I'm an associate professor of music theory and the past chair of the music theory department. I come before you today to call your attention to and to contest the decision by the provost to deny tenure to my esteemed nationally recognized colleague, Professor Mukherjee. On the merits, there's really no debate that Professor Mukherjee far exceeds the objective requirements for tenure. This is covered in detail in the appeal letter we sent you on October 20. But beyond the clear metrics, his being in the process of having three books published, his exceptional publication list, his excellent teaching reviews, and his outstanding service activities, I want to highlight the unique and extraordinary nature of Sam's work in the field of music theory. His research and scholarship is that rare breed of work that attracts the avid interest of eminent scholars outside his field. Prominent linguists such as Noam Chomsky and Samuel Epstein have admired his research, Professor Epstein choosing to become a collaborator. And H.V. Jagadish, the Bernard A. Gawler Collegiate Professor of EECS and Director of the Michigan Institute for Data Science has also worked with Sam and describes his work as, quote, inspiring a whole range of scholars in music, in linguistics, and in data science to begin conversations with one another and to see new connections. This testimony and the many others included in our appeal show Sam to be that rare academic whose work is so thoughtful, creative, and novel that it attracts the attention of scholars in fields as diverse as music, linguistics, and engineering. These accomplishments are of particular note as they're being achieved by a minority scholar focusing on non-Western music and cultures in a field traditionally dominated by white men studying Western music and cultures. Thus, he is an important role model for other minority scholars in our field, while also diversifying the field itself. In this regard, he's an important representative of our department, school, and university. Beyond all this, Professor Mukherjee has remained a truly fine human being. In the words of our linguistics colleague, Professor Epstein, whom I cited earlier, quote, Sam is a very decent human being and one who cares deeply about the human condition and the future of our species. This too is desirable, and I think an important property in a teacher, researcher, and colleague, end quote. Denying Professor Mukherjee tenure would be a grave mistake. 
and a decision whose consequences will reverberate far beyond the confines of this university. And given the state of our culture at the moment and the social movements that are afoot, this decision could affect the reputation of our department, the school and the university for years to come. My hope is that after you review our appeal and the underlying circumstances, you will make the right decision, adopt the recommendation of the school and grant Professor Mukherjee tenure. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Petty. Our last speaker, the, the speaker who was going to speak had a family emergency or something and had to leave, so will not be coming. So our last speaker today is Ramon uh, Satendra. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Regents. Uh, my name is Ramon Satyendra. I'm an associate professor of music theory at the School of Music. I previously chaired the school's music theory department. I'm also appearing in support of the appeal of Professor Mukherjee's tenure case. As you have already heard, Professor Mukherjee is an exceptional scholar with a straightforward case for tenure. But even beyond this, I wanted to emphasize how much of an asset Professor Mukherjee is to the university. His scholarly conference events, grant projects, and world music concerts are popular and well-attended events in our field. These achievements are reviving the external reputation of our department, both in the university community and at our peer institutions. His classes are extremely popular. Uh, the current enrollment in one of his courses, for example, is over 150 students, even with the COVID pandemic and his teachings impact radiates beyond the course topics. For example, his course on world music theory was singled out by students and alumni of the School of Music as one of only two courses in the school that promotes anti-racism. And focusing on the issue of anti-racism, I wanted to mention how the provost decision is being filtered by minority faculty. The issue is not simply that Professor Mukherjee's tenure case is strong, that it exceeds all objective merit-based requirements for tenure. It is the fact that in the past decade, the provost has recommended tenure for music theory faculty whose cases were weaker than Professor Mukherjee's and who also happened to be white. This is not to denigrate their tenure cases or my colleagues, rather it is to emphasize the objective strength a Professor Mukherjee's tenure case, and to call into question why a minority faculty member is being held to a differential and higher standard than some of his white colleagues, and further, why it is a standard that the university is refusing to define or disclose. Left unchecked, the provost's action will send a strong signal. It will reinforce the view that the university pays mere lip service to the ideals of fairness and diversity, an impression that is already being strengthened by the fact that the department is replacing Professor Mukherjee with yet another white faculty member. I come to emphasize that what is at stake here goes far beyond a simple tenure decision. With this in mind, I hope that you see fit to revisit the provost's determination and take action to correct this wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it, that concludes the speakers? Yeah, yes, it does. Okay. I yeah. just, uh, on behalf of the uh, Board of Regents and the administration, I just wanna thank all of the speakers for taking the time uh, to speak with us. Thank you very much. Okay, I now call us adjourned. Uh, thank you very much, uh, regents and executive team and members of the public. Uh, stay healthy and go blue.